My name is Petra Chuckert. I'm an associate professor at Penn State University. I'm in the Department of Geography, but I'm also associated with the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. And uh, on top of that, I have a research affiliate position with a climate change research unit in Norway called Cicero. And I have been heavily involved in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC Worker Group 2, which looks at uh, impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. And I've been working on a chapter, a new chapter in Working Group 2, Chapter 13, that looks at livelihoods and poverty. It is really important to look at gender as well as other dimensions of identity and inequality in the context of climate change, and that is for a couple of reasons. Um, the newest IPCC report tells us quite convincingly that climate change impacts and risk to climate change are very much related to vulnerabilities that exist in societies. Now, these vulnerabilities are very much a function of how marginalized or how privileged people are within society. And so the more privileged they are, the more options they have, the more capacities they have to prepare for changes, to prepare for extreme events. And the more marginalized they are, the less options they have. Now, what we have found consistently throughout the literature is that gender plays a role in terms of inequalities. So the higher and more pronounced inequalities are within a society, the higher the likelihood that a certain group of people will be marginalized and hence will be more vulnerable, will have less opportunities to adapt. Now, gender is one of the various dimensions of inequality. Other dimensions are age. So we look quite a lot at young children, the elderly, but also race, ethnicity, in certain countries, caste, uh, ability, disability. These are all dimensions of inequality and, of course, also identifiers or, or signifiers, markers of identity. But we look at these various drivers of inequality and dimensions of inequality to better understand vulnerability and uh, risk. Now, there has been quite a mushrooming of literature in the domain of gender and climate change. So we have seen that over the last yeah, 10 years or so. Now, what is important about this, of course, is that we pay attention to gender. Um, however, there are two pitfalls that I think we have experienced while working through the massive amounts of literature, especially for this IPCC assessment. One is that very often gender is just um, reflected in the literature as women. So there is a tendency to only look at women or primarily look at women and the impacts of climate change. And uh, the focus here is how women are differentially or more severely impacted by climate change. And it's important, but of course it essentializes women. It portrays women, especially women in the global south, as poor and helpless. It portrays them of victims of climate change without having any voice, without having any knowledge, without having agency. And that is, of course, not true and hence problematic. And of course, there's the flip side of only looking at women, which in one way, of course, obscures and, and hides how men are differentially impacted, or certain groups of men. So there's very little research that has been done on climate change impact on men, especially men who are marginalized in society. What we do know from various extreme events, for example, Hurricane Mitch in Central America, is that men, actually more men died during the hurricane because they were expected to assume a heroic role of lifesavers. And many of them, of course, were not equipped to fulfill that role and, and died. So when we talk about gender, what I think we really mean is differential impacts on men and women and the roles men and women fulfill in society. Um, and I think the, the second major problem with the very narrow focus on women is that this type of literature and many, many case studies we see ignore that we are not just women, right? We are 
women with a certain age, with a certain background, myself, uh, being white, being privileged, being well-educated. So we cannot isolate the fact of being a woman or a man from other drivers or markers of identity and dimensions of inequality. And in fact, very little research exists that looks at gender and class or ethnicity or caste or age at the same time. And there's certainly a major gap that we hope can be filled soon. It's an interesting question to think about the role of feminists in debates on climate change. And I would say one doesn't have to be a feminist to make a contribution to really, really important climate change debates. But what we do see is that feminist epistemologies can be really helpful to help us understand vulnerabilities and risk to climate change. And when I mean feminist methodologies, I, I don't necessarily want to constrict it to a particular discipline, to a particular field. Feminist epistemologies are certainly used in philosophy, in critical theory. But I'm a geographer, and, and we also use feminist philosophy, feminist epistemologies, um, in addition to colleagues who work in philosophy. And what, uh, what that allows us to do is to understand how knowledge about climate change and climate change impacts is constructed. What counts as knowledge? What counts as evidence? And what type of knowledge may get left out, may fall through the cracks, or is maybe considered too difficult, too cumbersome to collect? And we see that quite clearly within the IPCC um, in Working Group 2, what counts as evidence for climate change impacts. So these very sophisticated methods, however, don't allow us to assess how people experience climate change. We call those embodied experiences, experiences that people feel on their very body. And quite honestly, we don't have good research yet that allows us to understand how people are psychologically, emotionally affected by climate change. What shifts in rainy seasons, uh, extreme events, droughts or floods mean, for example, to women who have to collect water, collect firewood, who may not be able to clean themselves when in um, kind of a post-hazard, post-disaster camp. These are all direct and indirect dimensions of climate change impacts that the very, very sophisticated and nonetheless rooted in, in physical science assessments, what these methodologies don't allow us to do. So feminist epistemologies open our eyes to a broad understanding of what counts as knowledge and how we can assess this type of knowledge at scales that range from obviously the international global scale to the scale of the body. And I think that is a very, very important contribution. I think another contribution that feminist epistemologies allow us to make is a more, a more sophisticated focus and a more sophisticated frame of analysis to understand what I mentioned earlier, these, these intersecting dimensions of inequality. There's a term for that, we call it intersectionality. So how these different dimensions of inequality along the axis of gender, race, ethnicity, age, caste, disability, how they intersect. And I think paying attention to such intersecting uh, dynamics is really something that feminist researchers or researchers who employ a feminist methodology can help us pursue. My research has been really, really fascinating so far, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that I have a chance to do very ground-based field work, ground-based field work meaning with communities uh, both in Africa and in Asia on climate change experiences, on observations, but also on how uh, we collectively 
communities, researchers, NGOs, governmental officials can prepare to be better equipped to face climate challenges and other challenges, uh, how, how to be better prepared to face them in the future. So that is one really important work of my research, and I can expand on this in just a moment. The other one has been my experience with the IPCC as a coordinating lead author, as I said earlier, on a new chapter that deals with livelihoods and poverty. So it's the first time Working Group 2 in the IPCC looks at impacts on poor people in the broadest sense and livelihoods. So very often, of course, when we think about poor people, we think in terms of economic measures, poor thinking income poor. But of course, there are a multitude of measures to describe who is poor. We call this multidimensional poverty not having access to resources, not having access to educational services, being in poor health, all these components encapsulate poverty. So our task was to see whether or not climate change does have an impact on poverty, and of course it does on many, many different levels. For example, it makes people who are poor in a transient way throughout certain periods of a year more likely to become um, chronic poor or chronically poor and that is certainly something that had not been part of any IPCC assessment before. We of course also understand that the poor people don't just live in poor countries. Uh, we now know that actually most of the poor live in middle-income countries including China, including India, but also Brazil and it's important to not forget that people who live in poverty, people who are marginalized in countries that have progressed tremendously, have made tremendous economic progress, are nonetheless at risk and affected. And of course that also means that people in the US, people in Europe, people in high income countries who are marginalized are significantly experiencing the impacts of climate change. For example, the Chicago heat wave, turns out that most of the people who died were old, single, black men who were isolated within their society, who had nowhere to go, and hence suffered the consequences of this incredible heat wave. Very similar patterns in France during the heat wave, and of course the same pattern is visible when we think about cold spells, right? So who are the people in our society who are at risk, who are vulnerable? And I think this is what our chapter really does um, demonstrate quite, quite convincingly. My own work in the field has to do a lot with not just assessing vulnerability. I think we are beyond the point of just assessing how vulnerable people are. My work really contributes to how we can enhance uh, people's adaptive capacity. What that means in terms of understanding change, environmental change um, in the broadest sense, what people have observed, and how we can complement their observation, their very empirical and ground-based knowledge with the best signs we have. For example, downscaled climate projections, and how we can, in a very culturally appropriate way, combine these two. We call this the co-production of knowledge to generate um, we call those participatory scenarios, storylines of how the future could be in rural communities at the level of district, um, district level, disaster risk managers. And by envisioning how the future could be, we are already in a better position to, to identify actions that we have to take today, decisions that we have to take, and understanding which possible decisions and actions may increase our vulnerability in the future. And doing that collectively is, I think, an incredibly important element of enhancing adaptive capacities. Important next steps in this entire um, understanding of climate change impacts and vulnerability, um, I can see them at two different levels. One is at the level of research, and the one is at a very practical and, and also policy-related level. So I think in terms of research, what uh, 
I would be absolutely committed to pursue over the next couple of years is a better application of this fairly theoretical concept of intersectionality I mentioned before, right? How can we design better methodologies to assess how different constellations of inequalities interact, how they change over time, how they change in specific contexts, and what these intersecting dimensions mean for shifting vulnerabilities. I think this is really, really the key gap in the literature right now. So if we can move from these many, 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 and many good case studies on impact of climate change on women to a better understanding of intersecting inequalities, uh, then I think we have, a, have made a major step forward in understanding climate change vulnerability. And I think uh, from a scholarly perspective, that is exciting. It's challenging, but I think this is where our efforts should go. On a more practical level, I think it is absolutely crucial to also uh, contribute to training. I, I work a lot with research partners, for example, in Ghana, in Assam, India, and for sharing the best insights we have and for sharing the best methodologies that help us not only to do and conduct research, but to enhance these adaptive capacities. So how can we do a better job facilitating capacity building on the ground with people who have been disadvantaged in their own societies, who have been marginalized? And I think there are a wealth of fantastic ideas and, and methods out there that range from uh, participatory video to games to environmental theater. So I think we can be really, really creative to, to facilitate this type of learning. I also think it is absolutely essential for us as researchers to reach out to people who work at the policy level. For instance, I work with disaster risk managers in Assam, northeastern India, to better allow them to incorporate climate projections, to incorporate what we know from various dimensions of vulnerability in their five or ten year risk management plans. They have a mandate to do that, but very often they don't have access to the best science and they don't have access to, to various computing facilities, methodologies that allow to tease out the very, very detailed findings we have from the community level. So if we can do that and collaborate with disaster risk managers, whether that's in India or Assam or here, I think we also make an incredibly important contribution that will allow us to be better prepared and, and better equipped to deal with the challenges that are definitely ahead of us.